My name is John Hess, I'm with Scenic, um, and I wanted to first thank Montana State University and Jerry Sheehan's team for hosting us today. Very much appreciate it. This is a great venue. We were here last year for the NRP meeting. And I imagine that many of you either that are here today will be joining us in, over the next couple of days for those meetings. And so today we have kind of an extension of the Fiona workshop that we had put on the previous uh, three days. Today has been um, re rebuilt as an intensive introduction to Kubernetes. And so we have a pretty good program from uh, speakers from, uh, including Sha Feng Dong, one of the, um, among the first NSF um, grant recipients for cyber infrastructure engineer currently at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. We also have uh, uh, Dima Mission from SDSC and one of the lead engineers uh, behind the PRP and the Nautilus Kubernetes uh, cluster. Nadia Williams from SDSC and uh, also on the PRP. And we have some other speakers uh, later in the day, including Chris, Chris Paolini from San Diego State University and uh, Kishor Kishore Ahur from Google, uh, closing out the day. So one of the things that uh, Chao Feng wanted to offer people that are uh, joining us here for his session is that there, uh, you could follow along his presentation by downloading uh, the Docker Community Edition. And then there's a link uh, in the agenda to do that. And if you're searching for Wi-Fi access, uh, probably for those of us coming from campuses, uh, Edge Room is available, uh, and that there's also a uh, open guest network that MSU provides. So please use whichever of those two seem most suitable. And uh, I believe for as far as other logistics, as you mentioned, we have these sessions will run through to uh, break at lunch, and lunch is provided. And I believe that we will have some uh, caffeinated and other beverages available uh, during the morning session. And then in the afternoon, we will also have some uh, light snacks and other refreshments. Uh, restrooms are across the hall here to my left. And if you have questions of us, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. And with that, I will have ask Sha Feng to uh, take over. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you didn't hear Tom, uh, power strips are on their way. <laughs> Thanks, John. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Uh, my name is Xiaofeng Dong. I'm a, a cyber infrastructure engineer uh, from UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to, uh, to containers in general, and Docker in particular. Uh, a lot of you, I guess, might already have experience uh, playing with Docker, uh, but some of you may not have the experience, but this is a level setting uh, lecture so that uh, we get you on, on ramps, so later on you can appreciate more advanced talks by other speakers today. Uh, how's the volume? Can you hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Okay, uh, what are containers? You might have heard uh, container stalkers all the time. Uh, they are really, really hot, but, uh, but they are not new technology. They have been around for a long, long time. Uh, container, right, uh, is just another kind of uh, virtualization technology. Uh, sometimes also known as uh, operating system never virtualization, uh, which refer to an operating system feature in which the kernels allows the existence of, of multiple isolated user space instances, right? Uh, nowadays we call them uh, containers, but in the old days we call them partitions, jails, as, we, as I just said, they have been around for a long, long time, right? If you are a uh, old veteran of Unix, right, you may have encountered uh, change root or free BSD jail, 
and Solaris zones, so on and so forth. But uh, it was uh, Docker, right? That that truly made containers into the uh, mainstream. Uh, totally changed the uh, landscape of containers. So we're mostly focusing on Docker today. So uh, as we just said, con containers are just another uh, virtualization technology, but compared to uh, virtual machines, right, there are a few uh, benefits for uh, virtual machines. If you, run a, uh, if you run virtual machines, right, you usually uh, have a hyper hypervisor sitting underneath, which which either uh, give you parallel virtualization or emulate the hardware. So inside the, hi inside the hypervisor, you would run uh, full-blown operating systems, right? You run all the gas operating. But on the other hand, if you do containers, right, uh, you don't run the full-blown, the full, the full stack operating system. Uh, so, they, so, they, uh, so the container environment or runtime provides the necessary plumbing for you. So you only need to run the necessary uh, applications along with the supporting libraries, which is much lighter weight, much more efficient than, uh, than virtual machines. Okay, so, so nowadays, right, Docker is the most popular uh, container system, which is essentially uh, what makes container into the mainstream nowadays, right? Uh, it uses a uh, lots, lots of a uh, lots, lots of uh, uh, kernel features unique to to the Linux operating system, such as uh, C groups, uh, lame spaces, uh, as well as uh, union capable file system such as overlay FS. And and uh, Docker is not only a container technology; is also a uh, is also a ecosystem. Uh, readily supports. Uh, for example, today's popular uh, DevOps workflows. Okay, uh, what are the benefits of container-based solutions? Right, there are there are a few. Right, there are a few factors. Right, they are flexible. Right, uh, you can you can turn almost every single applications right into a containerized solution, and they are also lightweight. Right, compared to virtual machines, uh, they are much. They use much less resources, right? The containers can leverage and shell the because they uh, leverage and shell the host kernels. They are also uh, interchangeable. That's a really nice feature, right? You can you can deploy updates and upgrade on the fly. Uh, Kubernetes, as you will learn later, truly truly takes advantage of this uh, interchangeable feature, and it's also portable, right? Uh, that's why we ask you to to download Docker to your to your laptop. You can actually you can actually uh, you can actually play containers on your laptop, do development on your laptop, and later on you can deploy you can deploy your your uh, your container your applications to the cloud and run anywhere. So it's so so powerful, and it's also it's also scalable, right? You can run all the way from your laptop even to uh, to the cloud. To the clusters, right? You can increase and automatically distribute container replicas, and it's stackable. It's, it's stackable. You can stack service uh, virtually or on the fly. That's that's so amenable to today's workflow, such as microservices. You can stack, you can stack, isolate many many services together to make a to make a big applications. So it's so nice, right? Uh, uh, John has talked about installing Docker, right? Uh, it's, it's so easy, right? You can actually install, uh, as we just mentioned, you can install the uh, Docker Community Edition, which is freely available by following, uh, by following the instruction, right? Uh, if, you, if you download the PD, uh, PDF version of my talk, there's, there's a link for the download. And it's widely supported, although, although uh, uh, the talk we are talking about today is a is a Linux unique technology, right? But but uh, the Docker is actually available on many many platforms. If you install on on Linux, is Docker's native platform. But you can also install Docker's on on macOS or Windows. Uh, but essentially, they are running they are running uh, Docker inside a customer. Minimum Linux distribution, very lightweight. 
uh, this is also lies, right? If you, uh, for example, if you run Docker on the cloud, you're actually running Docker inside the virtual machine as well. This actually give you a little bit uh, uh, security, security enhancement. We'll talk a little more about security later on. Okay, uh, there is one post installation step for Linux. If you install Linux, right, uh, if you want to allow long root user to run Docker command, you need to uh, you need to create a Unix group called Docker and add a user add a user to it, right? Essentially, create a, create a group, then add a user to that group, whatever user you want to add. But there is a there is a big red warning, big big uh, caveat, is that uh, essentially when you do that, uh, the the Docker group actually grants a root privilege to the users. Uh, I, I know a lot of people already uh, are familiar familiar with Docker, uh, and a lot of people raise a uh, very valid concerns about uh, about Docker security in that this is main thing. If you actually net user run net user run Docker, you essentially give your users uh, root privilege to your host. Okay, what well, well mentioned, uh, this is not a talk about uh, Docker security, but uh, along the way, uh, I mentioned uh, some of the uh, security imp implementations of running Docker. Okay, but once you install Docker, right, once you install Docker, uh, then you can, the first step, right, to is just to test it, to make sure it's running. Uh, and I have Docker, uh, I have Docker uh, installed both on my, local Windows Net uh, laptop, and also uh, on a remote uh, Linux box. Let me uh, show you some quick demos, right? So this is my, this is my uh, Windows uh, PowerShell, PowerShell terminal. So if I do, if I do Docker version, uh, can you see, can you see the fonts here? You can see that I have I have Docker installed. Although this is the Windows, right? Although this is Windows actually uh, is runs it runs a uh, Linux virtual machines uh, using uh, Hyper-V. I can zoom it up. Yes, I'll, I'll do that. I, I'll zoom it up. So here's the command you run, right? Docker version. Right, you can show that it's running the latest version uh, inside the Windows, so, so Windows like that. And on my remote Linux box, here, right, as you can see, this is native Linux, right? I also have Docker in. Uh, I also have Docker uh, installed on that box, and uh, this is my username. This is a non-root users, but I, I, as I just did, I add that user into the Docker group so that that user can run the Docker command. So I can do Docker. Same thing with Docker version, right? It shows the same latest version running under Linux, same thing as that. You can also run which shows not more uh, verbose information about the Docker right on your platform. Okay. Continue on, right? They uh, when we do Docker, right? Uh, they first uh, we should introduce a few uh, terminology and concepts. Uh, you should be, you should uh, should know the difference between uh, containers and images, right? Uh, we we we'll talk about that, as we said, Docker is a container technology. So what is container? Container is actually a running instance that encapsulate. Uh, required software, so it's a running instance. Okay, container are always uh, created from images. Okay, so so image 
right, is essentially a package, right? It's a uh, executable package that includes everything needed to run an application, the code, runtime library, uh, environment, uh, configuration files, so on and so forth, right? Let's do the demo as well, right? So uh, let's go to my Windows then. So the first thing, as everything else, right, uh, in the computer world, the first thing we do is always we do a hello world, right? Let's do, uh, let's do hello world first. If you do uh, Docker run, as I said, Docker is a command, right? There are a few sub commands. If you want to run a container, right, that's how you do it. So you use this run command, and then you specify the image. So the first time we do the image. Hello, word. Can you see that? It actually runs. It runs. This is so simple. It actually says hello from Docker, right? If you if you have done this, it means Docker is running fine on your system, right? The first time it runs, right, it does it runs this image, right? Uh, if this image is not already on your system, it will download, it will download that image from the uh, from a repository, uh, Docker uh, registry. It download that image, then create a container from that image. Right? This is so simple. But but on the other hand, right, you can you can do uh or we'll sh we'll show you more demos, but you, once you have go through this, uh, have gone through this basic step, you can run much more ambitious uh, Docker images. But before, I, before you do that, let me show you a few things, right? The, the difference between images and, and the containers. So if you, if you run, Docker, sorry, Docker image, this image some command, right? If you do ls, you list all the images on your system ready. See, I have already downloaded quite a few images on my system, right? They are, I have, I have uh, some Linux container and Nginx, a web server, right? Also this Hello World image, right? I actually create a container out of that image, I just run that. And another command you want to know is this uh, container ls which shows you, if you simply run this, which will list all the running containers, running containers. But right now, since, since I, I just run this uh, hello, hello world image, but it's already uh, finished, so there's no running containers. But if you give it this option, A option, right, you will see, you will see that they will show all those, uh, all the, all the, uh, all the uh, past containers I have I have run on my system, as you can see that I just run this hello world, this containers, right? It has a container ID, right? It was created from that image, right? It runs this command from that, and this is the time it runs, right? And if you don't give, if you don't give, uh, you can, optionally, you can give a, uh, your container a lane. You container so that later on you can you can reinvoke that container. But if if you don't uh, provide a lane for your container, right, the system will automatically uh, give you a lane, right, in a combination of like adjective and some uh, some famous uh, computer scientists or computer engineers, such as this is the lane, right. So. Uh, so since this already has a name, so if you want to restart, right, if you want to restart this container, right, not, not, not from the image again. If you, if you run this, if you run this hello world again, right, you will run this again, it actually will create another container out of this image. So if, we, if let's do this, right, as you can see that, I'll actually have two containers on my system, 
right? That was created from the same hello world image, right? But once you have the container already there, later on you can actually uh, restart that container, for example. Uh, and given the, the last option, you can use this uh, Docker start, then you can either give the uh, container ID or the container, container name to restart it, let's do that. See? It runs this again, right? Okay. All right, so this is a quick summary, right, of the, uh, of all the, uh, of the, all the uh, basic commands, right? So if you want to run, if you want to run any containers, right, from an image, that's how you do it, right? But if you want to run a, uh, let me show you this later, but then I already showed you that you can use this command to list all the images on your system. If, it's not, if you try to run any uh, image, right, if it's not there, it will automatically download the image from the internet. That's, that's what makes Unix so appealing because it's a, it's a really nice package. It's an it's a ecosystem, right? Then you can, list, then you can uh, use those two commands to list all the containers on your system already. Then you can choose to, to start it, so on and so forth, right? Uh, this, is the, this is the new way of doing that. Uh, this is the old way, using Docker PS, doing all that, right? So, uh, this is the more ambitious way of running, uh, running a Docker image, right? You can actually sort of run in a, like a uh, Ubuntu virtual machine, right? So, let's, let, let me show you that. Here, here I, I can choose to um, here I can choose to give this option right. Uh, this means uh, uh, RM means that uh, once I finish running this uh, running this uh, container, it will automatically delete this container from from my system instead of leaving it there. Sometimes you want to do that when you do experiments, right? Okay, so here, right? I I want I don't want to return I don't want to return this container after I run after I finish running this. Here I want to uh, here I'm running this Ubuntu uh, image, right? I'm I'm creating a container from the Ubuntu image, but I want to run a uh, interactive session, right, with a terminal, and I want to run this command bash in my in my Ubuntu uh, in my Ubuntu uh, image, right? Once I do that. Oh, sorry. Oops, it's hard for me. I'm actually inside, right? See? Instead of just running a simple application, I'm actually inside the container, which is similar to uh, if you have doing a virtual machine before. This is similar to, to a virtual machine. I'm inside, the, uh, I'm inside my Ubuntu image, right? I'm running bash. I can do all sorts of things, right? I do LS. You see that? I, I can list all the uh, all the months here, so on and so forth, right? Okay, just like that. And once I quit, I can then I can, once I'm done with that, I can type exit to quit that uh, session, right? Uh, because I'm using this uh, uh, dash dash rm thing. So if if you if I do this uh, Docker container again, you will see that, right? You'll see that although I have just finished running this container, uh, it once it's done, it was deleted. You don't see you don't see it listed here. Sometimes this is a good practice to 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 uh, to clean up your your gutter, right? Okay. Yeah. 
just like a virtual machine, right? Networking is also a very important component of this uh, container uh, technology, right? Uh, Docker actually supports a variety of uh, networking options, right? Uh, Docker's uh, networking subsystem is uh, pluggable using drivers, right? Uh, it relatively supports uh, Bridge, right? the, uh, which is the default uh, network driver. It also supports uh, the host. This is actually a this is actually a dangerous thing. I'll show you later. You can also do over uh, overlay and do Mac VLAN so on and so forth. Uh, Kubernetes fully utilize all those uh, networking options. Okay, so. When you when you are uh, when you are trying to in uh, networking, right? You can first list all those uh, network available on your system. Then, in that case, for example, yeah, you can you can run a the uh, the Docker image uh, ng uh, nginx, which is another popular uh, web server platform, right? You can you can do that. Right? So in that case, you can uh, let me explain this a little bit, right? So you can run you can you run this you run this image in uh, nginx right you run this in, but in this way in this uh, example you actually give it a lame you actually give it a lame instead of using the default uh, lame right then because uh, because the default because the default networking is uh, is bridge right is bridge, so the uh, container has some IP, but you won't be able to see it. The way actually to access the web server is actually to expose to expose the container uh, TCP IP port to your host port. That's how you're doing the, doing this mapping. Once you do that, because that default is uh, is is bridge, right? Once you do that, right, then you can actually uh, load this web server, right, uh, in your physical host. Then you can use, uh, then you can inspect the uh, the bridge network doing all that, and you can also uh, inspect the uh, containers. So let's do that. So you can see that on uh, on my uh, Docker runtime on Windows, right? If I list a uh, Docker network, right? I do have the options of uh, bridge, host, and lang, right? Then if I do run this, then let's give it a link. One, right? Uh, then we want to do. Uh, let me make sure I, I type the right thing. Okay. Just a program update. The coffee has arrived and is along the back wall. Let's run that on my on, on my Linux system. Okay, so if I do ng. Yes, you 
if I do this on my uh, Linux system. Okay. I'm running this command, right? I'm running this on my uh, on my Linux system. I'm running Docker run, right? I give it a name. Uh, I give it a name here. Then I'm trying to uh, expose the uh, because the web server, right? The uh, the standard TCP/IP port uh, port is 80, but I want to expose that that to my system as uh, as uh, uh, 8080, right? I want to expose it. I want to run it detached, so I don't. So it run it will run that in the background, okay? So once I have that right, you can actually, uh, for example, you can actually uh, run in curl. Uh, right, you can actually see that the web server is truly running on that end. It web server is truly running. Um, that certainly shows all the web pages. I can I can also because this is uh, this is running on my remote uh, Linux host because my uh, my firewall my firewall doesn't expose that doesn't expose that port. If it's exposed, then I can simply uh, point that to my to my uh, URL lane. You can actually access that. But I can also but let me actually. Uh, but it's, it's actually uh, possible, it's actually possible, right, uh, to do a SSH uh, tunneling, so you can actually load that. Uh, I don't have time to show you that, but then, as you can see that, right, as you can see that, right, if, are, if I list all the running containers on my system, because I put this container in the background, at, it actually shows this is still running over there, right? It's listening, it's listening at this port. It's got exposed to the host port, 8080, right? The container name here is engine 10. It's still running over there, right? Then you can do in, uh, then you can do in uh, some uh, inspections here. You can actually, uh, so here you can actually inspect, right, as always, right? You can actually uh, inspect uh, this default uh, bridge network. You can already say that uh, by running these containers, I'm using this uh, default bridge network. And, and the, uh, the, uh, the sublet for this, for this uh, bridge network is, is this, right? The gateway is this. You can actually pin to that. And then actually I have a, this is the bridge network, and I actually have a running instance. This is the IP address of, the, of that containers, right? It also got, uh, got the port exposed. And I can further, uh, I can further inspect the, uh, the containers. See, I can, if I inspect, if I, ins if I, with that command, right, with that command, uh, I can see lots, lots of gory details, uh, lots, lots of gory details about, about my containers. But uh, the things we are interested in is, is the port, right? So the, uh, so the uh, networking mode is the default, right? Networking mode is the default bridge, right? Uh, the containers is listening on the uh, TCP port 80, but it got exposed to the host port, host port 8080. All right.
This is an example of, uh, of the default uh, networking uh, using bridge. But on the, on the other hand, right, you can also, you can also, uh, you can also use, use the host mode. This is, actually, uh, this is actually very dangerous. If you run, if you give this option, dash dash network host, right, then it actually use the host network. You lay, you, your native host network rather than the containers, right? Then you don't, then it actually automatically runs, runs uh, the TCP IP port 80 on your host, on your host. Let's do that again. Oh yeah, uh, you shouldn't, you should, but that's, that's the, uh, uh, Docker is actually, is actually a, a uh, uh, is double edged sword and it's a very sharp double edged sword, okay. Uh, if you do that, right, it's actually taking over your your host networking, right? Once you do that, right, it actually use the host. Instead of you don't you don't need to expose that. You essentially take over the uh, uh, the host uh, TCP/IP port there, so you can simply load this one on the host. And as you can already imagine, this is dangerous, right? This is just taking over this uh, privilege uh, TCP/IP host AD. But on the on the other hand, right, you can probably uh, listening to, to all the uh, network traffic on the host. For example, you can run a sleeper in your container, then you can listen to anything. Right? That's also dangerous. Uh, but you can do, it's ready, that, it's ready. This, uh, this is another, uh, this is another uh, security risk uh, related to, to Docker, right? You can, you can do that. Let's, okay, uh, let's not do the demo in this one. The next topic, also important topic, is storage, right? So far we have been running, oh, okay, I'll be ready quick. Okay, so far we have been, uh, we have been, uh, we have been uh, running, running, uh, running everything just inside the containers, but uh, uh, all, by default all files created inside the containers are stored on the writable container layer because we use the union file system. But, but Docker does have the option for uh, containers to store files in the host machine so that the files are persistent even after the container stop, right? Uh, you can, you can uh, the latest option is to use volumes uh, that are managed by Docker runtime. Uh, you, can, you can mount volumes on your host uh, to, to your Docker containers, right? Or you can, you can use band mounts. So essentially you can mount any single directory of your host to your Docker container, to your Docker containers. Or you can, uh, the third option is use, uh, is use a temporary file system in your memory to mount something to, uh, to your containers. There, those are all options here. I, it seems that I'm running out of time, so let me, let me just quickly do that. So uh, if you want to choose the right type of mount, right, uh, so the, the volumes are actually stored in a, in a part of the host file system which is managed by Docker, which is managed by Docker. This is nice. But on the other hand, the band mounts may be stored anywhere on the host system, right? They may even be important file system or directories, any files. So that's, that's another implication that uh, Docker actually, if you give the u user uh, the privilege to run Docker, essentially you give the user uh, uh, unhindered root pri privilege on your whole system. Uh, the third option is uh, type file system mount are actually stored in the whole system's memory only and are leveraged to the uh, whole system's file system. So I'll show you, uh, so let's give you some examples, right? So far, so far, uh, so far we have been doing everything just inside the container. Yeah, you can, you can modify the container, but what, what if you want to run, what if you want to run a uh, Nginx uh, web server, but you have some, uh, but you have some uh, static web content such as images, videos, that's, that's actually stored on your, on your host, right? One way to do that, one of the way to do that, right, is actually to mount a, to mount a directory, to mount a directory uh, in your host to to uh, to your uh, to your Docker image, right? This when you do that, this is you can put all your HTML files here, right? Then instead of serving instead of serving the contents from this default uh, uh, 
Docker place, you actually serve you actually serve the contents from your uh, from your host, right? Uh, I'm a little bit uh, careful here in, in that I, I made this one read only, but by default you can you can make it read and write, right? Then once you have that, once you uh, this is the this is the old option, right? That the the latest uh, the later uh, recommended option is to use in this this command mount type so on and so forth, but they are doing the same thing. Once you have that, right? Instead of serving serving the contents from this directory, you're serving that from your host. Then once you run this, you can change that to run this, okay? And then you can enter that command to, to uh, examine this. Uh, you can do that. I, I'm running out of time, but I, uh, I, should, I should emphasize again, this is, this is, a, this is a huge, huge uh, security uh, red flag. Potentially, right, potentially, uh, a, your container, your, your Docker users, can can uh, can mount your, for example, your the uh, slash etc, right? Uh, read and write can mod can see your password file and even modify your your password and so on and so forth. But this is really dangerous. Okay, and but it's nice. It's really powerful, right? Uh, as I already said, uh, Docker is a is a ecosystem, right? You have all those nice facilities, but you you, you may want to develop with Docker, right? Uh, you can modify. You can always modify your containers. You change, make change that. Then you can then you can actually save. Uh, you can save uh, your modified container, right, into a new image. But that is not the recommended way of doing that. Uh, the better and more general ways of doing uh, development with Docker is actually to to use a Docker file to to manage your image in a documented and maintainable way. That's so called continuous development and continuous uh, integration. Right? A, a Docker file is actually very simple. It's a it's a text documentation that contains all the uh, all the commands a user could call. Uh, on the command uh, line to assemble an image, right? This is the this is the uh, Docker file for the uh, nginx nginx image. As you can see, that is is really really simple, right? It's based on a it's based on a uh, the Ubuntu image, right? Then you can you can run some commands, just simple uh, bash commands here to to install, right? To install uh, the uh, the engine X the engine X uh, package, then make a few changes to to the system, right? Right. Then you can define the uh, multiple directory volume, so on and so forth. It's so easy, and you expose the port TCPI ports eighty for uh, for HTTP and for uh, for forty three for uh, HTTPS. Right. It's so simple. But let's see if you. I've just showed you option, right? Uh, one option to serve uh, to serve static contents is to use to mount a volume. Another way to do that is actually to create a a uh, simple Docker file to to sync a simple Docker file and to copy to copy your your contents, right? To copy your contents to that directory, to that directory, and once you have that, then you can actually build an image. You can actually build that image. Build an image. You can give it a new uh, tag name here, right inside that. Once you have, you actually have a locally built uh, new image that serves the uh, static contents for your uh, nginx server, right? Once you do that, you can list all the images, and you can run. Then you can run your own image, right, without mounting uh, external external volume, so on. So you can run that. Then you can load that to to check it out, and you can actually enter the container to to do all the testings. Right. Once you, right, this is nice. One, this is how you develop. And once you have that, you. Uh, but what good is your Docker images? Nobody else can use it, right? But there are a a spectrum of a wide variety of ways to get your images out uh, to the world. You can uh, starting with uh, starting with uh, the uh, you can share with your maybe coworkers the 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 images. Right, this is cumbersome, or you can use, or you can use a registry, Docker registry to to host that, or you can have host license on, on the uh, Docker Hub and so on and so forth. That's how you actually, that's how you get, 
Uh, that's how you download all those Docker images early on. That's because you are using a you can use a public repository as Docker registry. Okay, that's a very brief introduction. I'm 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 actually running out of time, but I'll be here all day. So feel free to uh, to ask questions. Great, thanks, Sean. And next up, we have. Nadia Williams from SDSC. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So I'm going to uh, give an example of how we use uh, containers and Kubernetes and a uh, few other interesting pieces of technology to build and deploy a Jupyter Hub container. So one may ask why Jupyter Hub? Right now, a lot of scientists and groups are using Jupyter Hub for, because uh, it provides a set of processes that tie together single-user Jupyter notebooks, and notebooks are used quite often as teaching materials, as uh, course development, and um, they provide easy way to deal with multiple data and um, languages uh, for people. Right now, Jupyter Hub uh, allows to have also Jupyter Lab, which is the next generation web-based interface for interactive development, and this is what is so attractive about um, using it. In a nutshell, Jupyter Hub has uh, three main subsystem. It's the hub itself, and hub manages user accounts and provides um, user servers. Uh, for each user, uh, there is a single server that is found on the hub, and hub manages all the authentication. Hub also uh, uh, configures HTTP proxy, and HTTP proxy, this is the public part that users are facing when they're connecting to a specific uh, URL that runs Jupyter Hub. Uh, the proxy is responsible for forwarding all the HTTP requests to the hub itself and to all the notebook servers that are spawned on user behalf. And the last part is the notebook server. It's a single user notebook server, but hub runs multiple ones single uh, dedicated uh, for each user. It is started as soon as the user logs in on the system, and the object that starts the service is called the spawner. So the basic operation of the uh, hub is when the user comes in with the web browser, um, the hub uh, actually launches the proxy, and then proxy begins to forward all the HTTP requests back to the hub by default and then Hub deals with the user authentication and adds user to the database if user is not already there, and then spawns a server on user request. And once the server is found, all the future HTTP requesters now are floating through the proxy to the Hub and to, to the notebook server. As far as authentication, Jupyter Hub supports several types of authentication. It can be simple uh, user password-based PAM user account for the server, and it can be uh, configured from a GitHub account, from single sign-on, from OAuth authentication, and that's the one I will be using here for the container. And uh, Spawner controls how the notebook is started and uh, what username, and it is started on the same host, and for each user it will be started on a separate container. And here the word container is a little bit overloaded. It's not the same as Kubernetes or Docker container. It's just a single entity within the Jupyter Hub. So again, uh, as a short summary, what are Jupyter Lab features? It's an interactive environment. It provides uh, access for the user to the notebooks, to the code, to the data. It has full support for the Jupyter notebooks and enable users to use text editors, terminals, and all the other custom components. In addition, one can write extensions and plugins and use these additional plugins uh, to work with their data and applications. So overall, it provides high level of integration between notebooks, documents, and activities. And as I said earlier, it is a very good uh, teaching tool that has been used in classrooms all over. 
So it provides drag and uh, drop to reorder notebooks. It provides run code blocks uh, interactively. It provides rollback of an interactive code and um, supports for popular file formats and so on. So why are we building Jupyter Hub container? For example, in our case scenario, we had a team of students that we are supporting and they needed access to multiple GPUs because they were running some um, TensorFlow applications and they did not have their own resources. So we wanted to build a Jupyter Hub container for them. And uh, so what do we need to do for the container? When we're running any application in container and the application requires configuration, we need to provide configuration for the uh, Jupyter Hub. And in the configuration, we need to see what type of authentication we are using and what type of spawner we will be using for this Jupyter Hub. In addition, because we want to run this um, as a service so it is reachable from the internet, we want to provide uh, authentication and we choose to provide OAuth authentication because this way we don't have to deal with user accounts. We actually delegate it to CI logon and then takes advantage of it. Then we want to bring user data or users will be bringing their own data on the container. So we need to provide data volume so we need to provide request for storage on our container. When users are coming in from the outside, uh, they, in principle, if they're users on our Kubernetes cluster, can log into their container, but then they have simple shell access. If we want to provide uh, web-based access, we need to uh, enable ingress, which will allow public uh, internet requests floating inside through the ingress controller and connecting to our local infrastructure. It's not like people can get in, but the requests can be forwarded to a specific port or specific service. So the ingress controller will provide automatic uh, and dynamic routing to enable uh, HTTP requests from the outside to go to a um, specific uh, container on a specific port um, inside the infrastructure. <clears throat> and uh, in order to enable it, we also need to have services running to expose a specific uh, service port on the container. And once we create all these uh, separate pieces, we tie it together with so-called deployment container that actually references all of the part, parts that I mentioned above. So let's look at them in details. This is the configuration map for the uh, Jupyter uh, Hub, and the top portion of it says that we're using a uh, local CI Lagoon authenticator. This is where we are going to actually um, say that this is the part where we'll authenticate our users with CI Lagoon. And the only user I'm creating here right now is myself because I am an administrator and I'm providing my um, UCSD legitimate um, a name. And here we are saying that whenever users come in and authenticate themselves, we're going to create a new account for them, for them and the account will become that user uh, email minus all the dots and all the add signs in them. And down below for the spawner, the last three lines indicate that for each user notebook, I will be spawning a server and it will be a Jupyter Lab. So then once we want to run this service, I want to register my client with CI Lagoon to be able to use CI Lagoon uh, authentication. So the URL on the top, that's actually where one would need to go and register your new service if you decide to run something uh, very similar. It doesn't have to be Jupyter Hub. It can be another service that requires authentication, but the uh, steps would be initially the same. So I am required on the form to provide just four pieces of information, which is the client name, and it is something that is uh, meaningful to you for your service. Then I'm providing my uh, contact email that has to be legitimate and verifiable. And I'm providing the home URL. This is the URL right now that my users will be later on coming to my Jupyter Hub container and uh, running their servers. And I'm providing callback URL. That's the important piece and that has to be uh, done right. And the last portion of it is actually, it's basically a home URL plus additional uh, few words here. And the last part of the callback depends on what specific um, service you're using for the for DHub, that's actually what's required. 
Once I am approved by CI Lagoon, I am receiving an email that will give me my client identifier, which is basically my proxy with some long string of characters, and my client secret, which is another very long uh, string of characters. So now, what do I do with this long string of characters? Kubernetes provides a way of actually getting this uh, sensitive information into the pod without explicitly specifying the strings. So for um, this case, we need to base64 encode the three strings and then put them in a YAML file that will be responsible for creating this um, secret. So what is the, um, on the left you see a secret file, so-called. This is going to be, uh, this is an object in Kubernetes that will be created. And the last three lines on, the last three lines on the left here, this is the ID and secret that I received after I registered my service, and this is the callback. So this is the information that later on in another YAML file will be passed as, um, not as a clear text, but as the string uh, to um, my container because three variables that will be needed for authentications will need to be explicitly um, as environment variables on container. On the right-hand side here, we have the uh, specification for the volume. Here, I'm requesting uh, half a terabyte of disk space, and it will be persistent volume. So once I start this object in our Kubernetes cluster, it will persist uh, until actually I shut it down. And if the main container with the DHUB application goes on and offline, the volume remains, which means all the user accounts will be safe for me and all the data that users bring and work with will be safe for as long as the volume is running. In addition, on the back end, on the Kubernetes side, uh, there is a way to actually uh, say that please don't shut this volume down, don't remove it if this specific object is shut down, save it, and this is possible. So then we are going to create ingress and service. Uh, as I mentioned before, ingress will allow me to route uh, public HTTP requests to the objects inside the infrastructure. And important part here is this one, the host name. Here I want to uh, identify the fully qualified host name and this is how ingress will allow my um, container inside my infrastructure to be reachable. And uh, we say here in the service that uh, we are going to use port 8000 and uh, on the Kubernetes side that what it means that every pod that I start that has K8 app a name Pragma GPU uh, and it will have a port 8000 open there. So this service will actually, Ingress will connect to this service and uh, provide traffic from the outside on this port to this container. And then uh, we, right now we actually put everything in a single YAML file. So this is the description of the D container, Jupyter um, Hub container that runs everything. And that particular file references all the files that I mentioned before. So for example, down below, right at the end, you see configuration file. So this is that very first uh, config file for the Jupyter Hub that we mentioned. Um, the environment variables you see on the left, like name, um, here CI Lagoon client ID, um, secret, and callback URL. These are the three strings that we encoded before, and these are going to be passed as these parameters in environment variable, but here you don't see anywhere any more clear text, passwords, or ID, or the client, it's all uh, going to be encoded. And uh, for the resources, I'm asking for 24 gigabytes of uh, memory here, and I am asking for eight GPUs for this container. I am also requesting a couple of volumes. One volume that we described before, this is a half a terabyte of um, data that uh, we want to uh, use for this uh, Jupyter Hub. And another one is we are going to mount that configuration file as Jupyter config file directly on a container so that when container starts and will start the application, it will have the correct configuration file instead of the default. 
So once we're done with all of this, then we can actually create right now all the objects and the standard way to create them. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing it, but this is the standard way to create them. So I create all the pieces that I need first, like configuration map, then I create secret and volume, ingress, service, and then finally, the last line, I will create my uh, container here. And so that's the last one, references all the services and objects that uh, started before. And if everything is correct, then I don't get any errors back. If I messed up somewhere, then I'm going to have a problem. And I'm going to actually verify that everything is running. So I'm going to switch here to... Can you see the... Uh, try this. So right now I am trying to see if I actually get confirmation that all my services are running and I am getting all kinds of information back. Yes, uh, they are running. So at this point, actually, I can go and um, log in on my um, Jupyter Hub right now. So I'm going to that uh, public URL that I mentioned before. And did I do that? I hope not. <laughs> So here, this is what I was talking about, sign in with CI logon. And so I see nothing right now except that I need to authenticate myself. If I try to authenticate myself, I'm redirected to CI logon and I'm asked to choose my identity provider. At this point, we allow, of course, all the legitimate ones that are here for UCSD people, they would um, use University of California uh, San Diego as their provider. And there is also a provision to use the Google authentication and so on. So once I authenticate myself, I will be redirected back to the um, Jupyter Hub and then I will log in. And this actually what it will look like once I log in right now. And right now I am logged in here as a user and um, Oh, I actually don't have this command, but I can actually see what is going on in the system. I'm running a very simple uh, program called Glances here that tells me a little bit about what's going on in the system, who is running. Um, right over here, I see that I have old HGPUs, and this is basically very just nice information about... Uh, memory and other processes that are going on. So if I am an admin that I know what I'm doing, then I can deal with it. Uh, so I'm going to open one of the Jupyter notebooks here, actually. And so those of you who are familiar with the notebooks uh, know how to run them. I have actually not run that many notebooks to work directly with them too much, but what it will look like, basically you can choose any cell and um, you can start running it and moving with the cursor you move to the next one to the next one if there are any errors you can edit information here you can um, open I can open another notebook here and I can move data and files between them and um, deal with some other editors and uh, so this provides this integrative environments that people enjoy quite a bit. Right now we support uh, eight, uh, well actually we, this is the um, Jupyter Hub that supports eight GPUs and we had 11 students working on this Jupyter Hub and um, when they were originally working on their own laptops, um, the simulations they were running took about 48 minutes. When they started using this uh, hub, the simulation that ran went down to eight seconds. So that was a considerable improvement. And they were able to run quite a few simulations trying to get to the competition that uh, we hope they win. And uh, so that's basically what the DHub is for. And uh, all the files, all the repositories, all the know-how to is in um, our repositories. And I will, um, at the end of the uh, file, the slides will be available on our website for the workshop. So if you're interested, there are uh, additional documents uh, that provide more information and then all the files that were used here and all the setup. So any questions for me?
Well, then I'm done with this demo. <laughs> Thank you.